Hello and welcome to the Property Buyer and Sellers Podcast. Sorry we've been away for a bit, but I am back and with you. How are you? Have you missed us? If you have, please like, comment, share wherever you're watching. If it's the podcast, then please give us a rating. And if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, then we'd be grateful for a like and follow as always. I'm Ken, uh, we're James Alexander, and we sell real estate in and around Norbury and Southwest London. How are you? Hope you're well. A few things to report on today. Firstly, and most importantly, um, what's better to have your house overvalued and then gradually come down in price or to have it valued at an accurate price and then sell it? Well, that's what we're going to come on to. But it also, there's another question that comes along with that. And it is, what's more painful, a kick in the nuts or childbirth? And I'll come back to you with a conclusion later on that. But first of all, let's talk about the property market. Number one, interest rates. That's the key thing. Everybody's worried about interest rates. We all thought they were going to come down much sooner. And it's very frustrating. Uh, we're told that interest rates are on the way down, but it hasn't materialized, has it? The reason for this is inflation. Inflation hasn't come down as quick as it was expected to do so this year. So the Bank of England and the Monetary Policy Committee members have said that they feel that holding interest rates at the last MPC meeting was necessary. There were a couple that voted against it, but largely they were in favour of holding interest rates where they are. Well, I think they held them for too low for too long, and now they're holding them for too high for too long. Uh, but then you can't please all the people all the time, I suppose. The point being, interest rates were expected to come down early spring. Here we are now in May and no interest rate reduction. What's going to happen next? Well, we've got another meeting in June and it's widely held that interest rates may be held again then. And I suspect they will. Uh, and then we've got another meeting in August. And the widely held consensus is that rates will start to come down in August. No one can know for sure because it's about the vote at that meeting and the data that will come out closer to the time. But we're hopeful of an interest rate reduction sooner, but it's likely that the interest rate reduction will come in August. But don't hold your breath too much for it because I don't expect it will be a large drop in interest rates. We're talking about a quarter point, but what it will signal, and this is the important bit, is a change of direction. And this is what we're all looking for, is the point at which the MPC committee say, enough already, interest rates need to start coming down. And you know, in a way, that's the idea of the whole interest rate rising situation is that the bank wants to promote responsible uh, attack on inflation and therefore they're gradually bringing interest rates down and they want us all to feel some pain and some unaffordability so that we don't overspend and salaries don't go too high and you get into that vicious, sp vicious spiral of prices going up and then wages following and where does that end well it ends up in hyperinflation and that's where we don't want to be so that's why and that's where we're heading uh, not great news I know uh, as far as the property market's concerned more broadly uh, lettings still an undersupply of property largely, but we have reached a bit of an inflection point on prices. What we're finding in the rental sector is all of a sudden it's that little bit harder to find tenants because prices are just so high. And of course, when you're looking for affordability, then the salaries of the people that are searching out those properties need to match those prices. If you're a responsible landlord, you want to be very sure that the tenant moving into that property has affordability. And of course, as rental prices soar away, wages haven't done the same thing. So it's a tough market out there for tenants, definitely. And it's tougher for landlords in the sense of prices are now plateaued, which is a good thing, I think. We don't want to see them run away too far. I think it's important that there's a balance, um, but it's always a bit mad. And it certainly still seems to be the case that rents are relatively here in London crazy high. As far as the sales market's concerned, it's flat. The reason it's flat is because we were all hoping for those interest rate encouragements and the confidence that would come back from that. And it just hasn't happened. In August, we will see that cut and hopefully that will bring through a little bit more enthusiasm. I suspect that it will remain flat for most of the year. And the reason for that is that even after that cut, and I think it will be the first of many, we'll also be likely seeing the announcement of an election. And in my experience, when an election is called, then confidence tends to go a little bit, especially when you're looking at a change of government. Why? Well, people are worried about what a Labour government might represent for the property market. How will they feel about it? What will they do for it? Will they go the other way and favour renters above uh, sellers and buyers? Who knows? The truth is that there's an element of we can look at their policies and that will be a sensible thing to do. And there's nothing in there that's vastly uh, against 
anything that we know other than they're more anti-landlord than the Conservative government. But then, even if you look at that, are they really? Because this Conservative government has done nothing for the small landlord. So I suspect it will be business as usual, but it'll be a while before that filters through. So this year, then, we're looking at slow interest rates, cuts, and we're looking at a flat market. Does that mean you shouldn't move home? Not at all. If you have sufficient equity in your home, always remember that sometimes it's just a sideways move. What I mean by that is let's say that last year your house was worth 600,000 and this year it's worth 590,000. Well, you've lost 10,000, haven't you? Well, not really, because if you're moving to another house at a similar value, that likely will have fallen the same amount. Now, there are area nuances and discrepancies if you're moving to an area which perhaps is all of a sudden uh, jumped in popularity. And it's likely that the prices are slightly higher there if your area hasn't jumped in popularity. But largely what you'll find is that the price reflections go across the market. And if you're selling for a little bit less, you'll be buying for a little bit less. And what you should be looking at is not the price you're selling for, but the difference between the price you're selling for and the price you're buying for, because that's the real cost of moving. You know, And if you have enough equity to make the move and you've decided it's the right time for your family, ignore the market. Because if you look at the market, there'll always be reasons why you should move or shouldn't move and do what's right for you and your family at the time it's right for you and your family for personal reasons. Maybe it's schools for you. Maybe it's retirement time. Maybe it's just a change of area because you're fed up with the way you want to live and want to live in the country or by the coast. Do it. Make that move if it's right for you. Life is short. Make sure you make the move exactly the time that is right for you. So um, on to valuation. One of the big frustrations is that a lot of agents are overvaluing. And this is what I meant when I say, you know, uh, about the uh, the kick in the nuts or childbirth, what's more painful. Well, I'll tell you what's more painful than both is being told that your house is worth less than you expected. And this is common throughout the UK. What we find is that agents go in and have all sorts of various varied valuations. And this is often the case, especially with the large corporates, some of which have a policy of overvaluation. Yes, that's right. You heard me right. They deliberately tell you that your house is worth more than they know it's worth. Why? Well, by telling you a higher figure than they anticipate other agents will go in at having looked at the facts, they're likely to gain the instruction on the basis of smowing, blowing smoke up the proverbial butt. And the reason for this is we all want to get told our house is the best one and worth more than anyone else's. And if we're not careful, we can get sucked in there and it really can be very painful to find that then another agent comes in and gives you a valuation, which is maybe 100,000 lower than the one you're looking at, which, believe it or not, is quite common. So the agent that you're looking at gives you a valuation of, let's say, a million. Another agent comes in at 900. You sign up for the million with the agent charging the much higher fee, but you've missed something, a really critical detail, and that is that the agent that's valued your house at a million is charging you 2.5% and 20 weeks of contract length. That means you're stuck with that agent for five months. Don't accept it. Do not accept a long contract from an agent with a very high valuation and a very high fee because they'll sell you their service on the basis that their fees are justified because they can obtain you a higher price. And that presumes that they're the only ones that can find buyers for you. And in this day and age, that's just not true. If you've got a good agent, be they independent or part of a chain, provided those inquiries are handled well and they work hard for you, People will seek you out. Now, there are some exceptions. You need to have an agent, which is on the big platforms, in my view. Where do people search? Well, they search on Rightmove, Zoopla, and on the market. Your agent should be on all three. That's a key question when you're looking at which agency to go with. But when an agent tells you that they've got branches all over London, and particularly buyers from Chelsea, buy in your small South London suburb, look between the lines. That buyer that is coming to whatever corner of London it is, in our case, Norbury will look at the area and they won't say, oh, wow, look, you know, I was looking at a, a flat in Chelsea that was a studio flat and I can buy a, a three bedroom house in Norbury. I'll buy that one. People aren't that stupid. That presumes they are. What's the next thing they'll do? They'll jump on right move and they'll look at the listings or Zoopla or on the market and they'll say, hang on a minute. There are more houses in this price range. Let's have a look at a few. And then they'll select the best one. So the idea that somehow these larger agents can select a buyer and push them across to an area that's cheaper and suddenly they'll buy that house is a myth. What they'll do is they'll be introduced to the new area, maybe. But then from that introduction, they will look at the wider market and they'll call whichever agent has the best house 
in that price range. Remember, there's two sides to this equation. Of course, as a seller, you want to achieve as much as you possibly can. But the other side of the coin is buyers are astute. No one spends this kind of money. It doesn't matter how much money they got without being sure that it's the right decision for them. And they take those decisions very, very carefully. So they don't just come to an area blindly and say, all right, hands up, this is the one. They come to that area and they research it thoroughly. They make sure that they're in the best street versus the price, the best house versus the price. And they really will be researching everything, regardless of where they came from, where they end up, they'll be scrutinizing as any sensible buyer would, and as, as I'm sure the people listening to this podcast would as well. So in terms of that, I would say, make sure that if you're told your house is worth more, make sure that's based in reality. How do you do that? Well, look at, try and be objective, sort of helicopter yourself out of your situation emotionally. And what I mean by that is imagine that you're kind of, you know, away from the situation, looking down on it and look on right move and say, right, okay, I'm looking around right move at the moment. I've got you know, 800,000 to spend. The other agents told me it's worth 800. What is available at that price? And if the other houses in that price range are similar to yours, then that sounds like you're probably on around about the right level. Um, but you've got to watch for that one as well, because if you're in, a, in an area where you've got agents overvaluing everywhere, then that can also be misleading. So the next thing you need to do is look at sold prices, find out the ones that have sold. Now, not just from verbal conversations with agents look on there's a good site called net house prices for instance where you can go on nethouseprices.com dial in your postcode and you can see what sales have been made it is a lagging indicator and that means that it takes a while for these sales to go onto land registry and therefore that they are picked up by this particular program or by land registry but because the market has been fairly flat over the last couple of years it will be a leading indicator and should be telling you what your house is worth so don't just take an agent's word for it have a look around and be sensible about it and here's the reason why if you go on for a figure which is higher than the market will stand what will happen is absolutely nothing and this is why these corporates sign you up for such long agencies uh, terms because they know that you're committed probably at this point to selling your property and now you're stuck with them regardless of the fact that they've misled you um, so now you're in a contract and I've got many people in this situation I know many people listening to this broadcast will sympathize with this they're in the middle of a contract they're frustrated because they were told a figure which is higher than the market will stand and that same agent is now asking for a very large reduction on that basis as well so then they're thinking well I'd like to get away from this agent because it's not fair what they've done to me here and if you're in for a five month contract or so which is quite often the case you're stuck with them for the rest of the year that means in, invariably more or less so you either relent and bring down the price in which case you're still paying remember that extra high fee because they were going to get you this extra high price but you're getting the same price as you would have got from any agent so don't be fooled and if they're asking for a very long contract and you're still inclined to go with them reduce the contract so it's the only way I'm doing this is if you give me, a, you say it's worth X. Okay, I'm giving you a shorter contract. If you don't, if you're not prepared to go with that shorter contract, then I'm going with another agent. And you'll find that many of them will refuse and insist on this very long contract because they know very well what we know. And that is that a house is worth what it's worth. It doesn't matter which agent's selling it. If they're doing a good job of defending the price, making sure they're dealing with inquiries, presenting it well, then it comes down to what it looks like, how it compares, and the motivation of the buyer and bottom line is if you're advertising all the right platforms and you're presented well and your price point is hitting the sweet spot you will get the best price if you're on for too much money when you eventually sell what will happen is you'll get less than you would have got because everybody's seen that price trickle down and down and down and confidence goes naturally people think ah that's the one that's been around for a long time because people can see when you originally published these days, the digital footprints are not hard to find. There are different tools you can use to find out when a property was initially marketed and even when the price reductions came. And therefore, buyers quite often will call up and they'll inquire in a way of, well, hang on a minute, it's been price reduced several times and now it's on with six agents. Why is that? And so you know, there's always this conflict between should I get the price right or should I overprice? You know, we uh, here in my agency, James Alexander, never want to see your house overpriced. But by the same token, we want to do the best for you. And sometimes that means you satisfying yourselves at a higher price, and that's fine. But we always find that hitting the sweet spot is the important thing. Getting it to a level where buyers are excited by it will mean that you'll eventually sell it. And without that, you'll struggle. And nobody wants that. You've made the commitment to sell. Make sure that sale works out the very best for you. 
Now onto the topic of childbirth or kick in the nuts. What's the most painful? Well, I have a conclusion on this. <laughs> well, obviously getting kicked in the nuts is more painful than having a baby. How do I know this? Well, here's my conclusion. After a year or so of a woman giving birth, she'll often say, I'll have another. You'll never hear a man say, I'd like another kick in the nuts, please. I'll leave you with that thought. Thanks for listening as always. And we'll be back next week with another edition. Hope you've enjoyed this. And if you have, please like and subscribe.